1,500 years ago, a young man named Benedict was living in Italy and attending school in Rome, the busiest, most cosmopolitan city of its time. Although Benedict had both wealth and privilege, he was restless and unhappy. Benedict found that the demands and distractions of the city made it impossible to fully pursue a spiritual life. So he left the city behind to live alone as a monk. Soon after, Benedict realized that the answers he sought were not to be found in solitude, but in forming communities with a solitary goal, a society based on prayer. Fifteen hundred years later, people all over the world are still following in Benedict's footsteps, including the monks of Mount Saviour Monastery, a handful of men seeking God, as Benedict did, in the shadow of a busy world. Those who follow their hearts to Mount Savior Monastery share a modern pilgrimage into a world devoted to a quest for meaning and goodness. Some come as young men and stay forever, while others come to rest a while, to pray, and to share in an extraordinary way of living. It's a little difficult question to answer there about what people aspire to in coming to a monastery and what the monastery perhaps uh, provides and expects and looks for and those who come. One of the things that has always, I think, been behind people living this kind of lifestyle is a certain quest uh, seeking for meaning in life. One, is, one needs to understand what life is about. Everyone at some point or other tries to figure that out. Even if it's a Christian or Catholic person that is aiming towards God and Christ, but they have other pools, family, business, work, success. For the monk, the main thing is to be geared towards finding God. Well, one day I was asked by a teenager, do you miss life? And my answer was that life is growth. But I think that by his definition of life, he meant, you know, excitement and uh, getting married or having big cars and all kinds of stuff. That's part of life, but it's just part of it. I guess that's the way I tell it to most people is, well, if I opt into farming, then I don't opt into being a stockbroker. Or if I'm a monk in a monastery, then I don't have the choice of just going wherever I want to go every day. Most of the time when people ask me what we do at the monastery, I simply say, we live here. They don't realize that 
we do everything they do, only we're doing it in a certain context. But that helps them, I think. We do more by accident than many people do on purpose. But if we try to do it on purpose, we probably mess it up. And that's kind of the secret of Benedictine life. It's a bit poetic. And it's not romantic in the cloud nine sense. It's based on the realization that God loves us and uh, is trying to get us out of our selves, you know, so that we are, in a sense, fruitful. It, in some sense, it's a very ordinary life. But all of a sudden, it dawns on the ordinary is extremely extraordinary. Guide us, O Lord, into the way of peace. Let me, Lord, the God of Israel, He has peace. Mount Saviour Monastery is a Catholic Benedictine monastery founded in 1950 on a wooded hill just outside of Elmira, New York. The roots of Mount Saviour trace back to Germany and the Abbey of Maria Locke. During the 1930s, under the leadership of Abbot Ildefons Herwagen, Maria Locke was known throughout the world for breathing new life and new interest into the monastic tradition. One of Abbot Herwagen's keenest pupils was Father Damasus Winsen. In 1938, when Damasus was forced to flee Nazi Germany, he came to the United States and began teaching in the Archdiocese of Newark, New Jersey. Father Damasus had planned to return to Maria Locke when the war was over, but the response to his teachings on monastic living and the liturgy was so overwhelming that he asked for and was granted permission to stay in the United States. He created a new foundation, Mount Savior Monastery. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. the Lord be with you. Amen. We hear today about the shepherds of Israel, uh, shepherds with whom God is mostly disappointed. So I think it's very pertinent to our own times. Shepherds in government, in the church, in industry uh, are a disappointment to us. And the solution to this difficulty really is prayer. Mount Savior is a Benedictine monastery, which means the monks structure their lives according to the rule of St. Benedict. The rule is more than a guide to monastic living. Its core principles are a treatise on how human beings can effectively work and live together. One of the hallmarks of Benedict's rule is hospitality. The notion that human beings are responsible for the care and well-being of other human beings is also at the core of Mount Savior's philosophy. Welcoming guests, welcoming one another, is something which is biblical. And because it's biblical, it's also Christian and is a part of our Good. life. Good, how are you? Good to see you. Good. 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 So, welcome aboard. In most monasteries, um, in this country, uh, education was the work of the monastery and still is. Many monasteries had high schools, colleges, universities, and the monks became teachers. This monastery uh, deliberately did not do that. So therefore, for us, hospitality, pure and simple, they had to become a, a more prominent thing. Mount Savior receives over 1,000 men and women of all faiths every year. While staying at Mount Savior, guests are encouraged to participate in the work, prayer, and study that are the staples of the monastic day. The rhythm of life at Mount Savior provides guests with a context for reflection 
and a prism through which to view their own lives. For the monks, the people that visit serve as a powerful reminder that their way of life has meaning and impact far beyond the hills of the monastery. There are many ways to learn in life. We have the media, uh, we have one another, and it, in a monastery also we learn from the guests who come with different experience. And at the same time, they learn from us because ultimately we have very similar problems, so to speak. My name is Jerry Simmons, and I've been coming to the monastery since 1961. So I come here knowing that they're praying. It helps me when I'm out, away from this place by myself, when the culture says, just do something. And just to, not to do anything, to be able to be still and to be quiet is to me the essence of this place. <laughs> Mary, can you sing a song? No? What's your favorite song? Well, my work is taking care of three children at home. So coming here, it is a welcome respite. It, it invites our family to be hospitable to each other. It invites our family to, to be quiet and to observe some different rules that we don't observe at home. And it is a welcome, it is a welcome change. And guests come for one reason or another, just like I came here for one reason or another. We all are hurting. We're not coming here for a vacation. Well, you don't know who is hurting, uh, who is in need. And as I say, if everybody who comes here has a need, am I going to be the one to listen to that need. People are really searching, where is God in my life? How is God in my life? So in terms of, yes, I can believe that the monks here would experience a lot of darkness in people's hearts when they come here. Because indeed, uh, uh, there's a lot of that in the culture right now, a lot of depression. There's a lot of anxiety, a lot of repressed anger, rage, not knowing what to do with our feelings, with war, with whatever the culture is talking about. This provides a, a, a haven, so when people come here, they kind of kind of let go. And so what surfaces is the questions, the doubting, the wondering, the hurt. The thing that's uh, most impressive are the subtleties of the, uh, the lifestyle, um, the respect that the monks have for uh, people that come from all walks of life and come up this hill with all kinds of um, situations or problems uh, or uh, heaviness sometimes on their minds and the way that the, uh, the monks can handle that. I don't know how they, how they do it being hospitable all the time, their gift of hospitality. And so I, I tell them in the past few years I come here, I'd look them right in the eye and tell them, Thank you for the sacrifice, for welcoming new people and welcoming me back and having that energy to keep inviting people into your space. I think it's hard work, personally. Now, when we talk about hospitality, we're talking about receiving a person as a human being and, and being at, at, to being helpful for their needs and, uh, and really encouragement and, and, and all of that. really fostering the, the human race's recognition of its dignity. That's kind of what hospitality is, you know, for us. One frequent guest of the monastery wrote, Mount Savior acts as a kind of centrifugal force that pulls us to seek God, to respond to a personal need for centering. 
We come in search of a credible evidence of faith from which we can draw strength. We come here because we have a great need to know our faith is not folly. What we find in you is openness and easy hospitality. We find constancy in a handful of men who, in good times and bad, praise God in the presence of outsiders, in the privacy of community. O oh God of truth, almighty Lord, you rule the changing hearts of day, you send the beauty of the dawn and then the burning heat on you. Put out the fire of striking us, renew the morbid heat of sin. Our bodies are with loving care, upon our hearts your peace be so. O gentle Father, grant our prayer, and you his only Son. My first job was sweeping out to grandstand in a racetrack. Okay, my father, in a sense, got me the job because he knew the man who was the foreman. So when I went to work, I had a responsibility towards my father, towards my father's friend, and towards the job. I think it was 35 cents an hour, but anyway, uh, that's what you were doing, and you, you felt a certain commitment. Pretty soon people got a job to get something else. They got a job to get money to buy something they wanted. So the job wasn't a job anymore, it was a stepping stone to something else. And that notion of, of what I'm doing as a stepping stone to something else has, I think, crept into the culture. So I'm not doing what I'm doing, I got my eye on something else. And you can't be a monk with your eye on something else. The Bible tells us we are made in God's likeness. And for Benedictine monks, work is one of the key ways in which that similarity is realized. The work at Mount Savior is expansive, physically demanding, and time consuming. But luckily, the commute is an easy one. For the monks of Mount Savior, work well done is not measured by a paycheck. It's an expression of their humanity. Work has always been a, one of the components of, of the lifestyle. The daily chores kind of things, which are not terribly interesting things to do, but they're necessary things and they need to be done. And it's part of the, of the um, um, approach to the life is a willingness and a readiness to, to do these kind of things. In the Roman society at the time, this kind of work was done by slaves. The elite Roman uh, people, society people, would never think of doing this kind of work. So it was abhorrent to them. And, but but, uh, but in, the, in, the, in the ascetical life of the monasteries, um, that became uh, a way of uh, manifesting one's willingness and participating in the lifestyle and practicing uh, humility. I view that everything we do in the monasteries is part of the prayer. A formal prayer in the chapel or a prayer in your room or the work, they're all part of the life of the monastic life and the monastic life in itself is prayer. Perhaps that's why it was easy for me to, to adjust to this life and understand it. And that's why I chose maybe this life. Is that because I thought that everything Everything could be a part of your, of your spiritual life, of your way of going to God. Beyond the daily maintenance of the grounds and buildings, Mount Savior is a busy place. The monks run a religious article shop, and they make many of the crafts that are sold there. There's also an orchard on the grounds. 200 head of Scottish black-faced sheep in the fields and thousands upon thousands of honeybees in the aviary. All right.
I got interested in bees because I was working in the orchard. I have six sets here and nine sets up on top of the hill. And I just find it very peaceful. This hive is queenless. One of the signs is there's not a lot of traffic in front, but there are bees. What this does, it reinvigorates the bees that are in here that are queenless, makes them feel like they got something to live for. Once they find out there's a queen in the hive, like a lot of things in life, when you got a family, they, they work for you. Here we have 150 ewes. In a week or so, we'll, we'll inspect them from head to toe. We flip them upside down, we trim their, their feet, we check their teeth to see if they, they have enough teeth to, to spend the, the winter with us. And then we color code them according to the breed and bloodlines. Oh, works with animals maybe might be more conducive to uh, contemplation because this is God's creation and we are part of this creation. You have living beings, you have uh, all the process from making hay, uh, feeding them, and what comes out of them, sometimes not so, uh, not so good, but that's part of life. And uh, in some ways, it's part of the reality. You know, Life, monastic life is not a dream, or, or it's something based on, you know, our our part in God's uh, plan, so to speak, in God's creation. While the brothers can manage the care of the sheep most of the year, when it comes time for shearing, the larger community is there to lend a helping hand. In the barn. In the barn. Today we have families coming from Pittsburgh, Washington DC, from Massachusetts, and they come with their children. And especially yesterday when we brought the sheep in, we had two, two dozen kids trying to help bring them. And it was quite a, <laughs> a circus. shearing event is almost like a festivity almost in, in, in the Bible, in the scripture, in the Old Testament, Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, they're, they're traditionally were, were, were sheep farmers and nomads, and they moved around with their flocks all around the deserts of Palestine you know, looking for grazing. And when they had, when there came time for shearing, that was a time when they, 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 they settled down and, and all the clan would gather together to help with shearing. Well, I, I came on retreat in, uh, in 1970, and uh, from, uh, from the taste of that in 1970, I came back annually. I think people are seeking uh, some place where they can just take a look at what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Even in today's society, I think uh, just time to even mention the word God or a safe place to talk about God. I think we've thrown everything at people that we can and um, people still have a hunger for something that they, uh, they don't quite know what it is. For the community, the sheep farm is much more than a business venture. It's a constant reminder of the presence of God the bounty of nature, and the wonder of creation.
Now there's always so much junk on my desk and things of course come in like a waterfall or a hole in the roof because they're just, uh, communications are wonderful but you have access to a lot of people. Father Martin. Hi Martin. Chesterton has a wonderful phrase of something's worth doing, it's worth doing badly. So that gives me a great consolation that sometimes I do this job badly, but it's certainly worth doing. I'm the only CEO in the country that nobody wants his job, so, uh, but whoever gets it will probably feel the same way I did. It's, you know, more than I think I can handle. I didn't think I'd last 20 minutes, and I've been in longer than anybody in any of the abbots or priors in North America, probably most many of them in the world. But again, in the Benedictine monastery, the most important thing is not running around electing new people. The idea of stability that Benedict's uh, monastic life has really lets us settle into a place. O oh Lord, make haste to help me. Praise the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, both now and forever. Amen. Alleluia. O oh God, sustain all the glory, and move in your mighty power, and yet controlling day by day. The changing cycle of the years. Grant in the evening of desire the blessed light that never fails. A holy death your final gift until an ending glory comes. Friends and visitors to the monastery are often curious about how each of the brothers decided to become a monk. That's a valid question. After all, being a monk is not a job you can train for. The monastic life is a calling, and the call is answered differently by everyone who hears it. He is the word that brings salvation. He is the hand that you stretch out to sinners. He is the way that leads to your peace. Well, I first began to think actively about monastic life. I have actually fourth year high school when things began to move in, in, in this direction. I had previously been planning to go to another school after graduation from high school and in general like becoming a coach, a football coach or something like that. They had the school prom was, was the big event of the year. It was, it was fun, I enjoyed that and everything else. But <clears throat> But was, I think it was just after that, possibly, when I decided that I was going to go to the monastery. <laughs> there was one uh, um, young guy in high school that I knew who, uh, who was dating the girl that he married in high school, uh, during high school. Later on, they married, and they were good friends, and still are. And they came and do the visit, come and visit you know, the monastery. You know? So I would see them, you know, and, and they had children and everything else. And so, there was a certain attraction there and that, you know, I mean, a lo lovely family and couple and children and everything else. And, and so I, I felt a little sting there in a way, you know, that, that looked like a very happy kind of life to be living too. But, uh, but I was quite uh, decided that I had made my decision and this is what I was going to stick with and do. That's you? This one here with the bottle, yeah. They, I was taking a nap or something, they planted these beer bottles next to me and took a picture. <laughs> <laughs> I was an architect. I had studied architecture. I graduated from architectural school in Havana in 1952. I wasn't interested in being a famous architect or in uh, becoming rich. I wasn't interested in getting married either. So, so there didn't seem to be any dimension, any, any deep dimension to my life. And that triggered the question of, a vocation of giving myself to God. It took five years. I investigated different orders and I kept coming back to approaching God to a monastic form of life. Yeah, I'll be with you in a moment. No, before I came to Mount Savior, I was kind of a jack of all trade and, and I have a degree in literature but never worked with sheep or animals. I'm one of those who enjoy the routine, so to speak, because in some ways you don't have to think 
too much, you know, what to wear today and, and what to eat and all that. This is the idea of the, the monastic life. It's, to, it's a setup so that you are free for something else, free from certain things, from certain worries, and uh, you're free for more studies and more prayer, more time for prayer, and th this is a good thing. My parents drove me up here in August of 1957. That's how, how it began. I didn't tell a great number of people that I was coming here, though, because I knew most of them wouldn't have a foggiest idea of what I was entering upon. And I didn't want to be pressed for hard answers because I didn't have them at the time, because it's mostly an intuitive sense that I had. It wasn't something that maybe could be expressed. I didn't take the chance. I, I wanted to find out for myself, first of all. What kind is it? Uh, raspberry pie. Oh. Did you come out in the parking lot? No, Did come you? out in the parking lot and I end up with a raspberry <laughs> pie. He says, hey, I always come out in the parking lot more often. Oh, pie. Oh, yeah. You'll have to take it on faith. I'm going to the kitchen. It could end up in my room. The only time I had a misgiving, which is the sort of thing that happens to, I think, people when, after the honeymoon, is, uh, for me, it was the day after the Psalm Profession. Not at the Psalm Profession, because the spotlight's on you. It wasn't, wasn't a week before I looked at myself and said, what did I just do? And, uh, you know, you're at the bottom of the totem pole. You know, you don't have any will. You don't have any possessions. And you're just one of the ordinary monks, which is what you profess to be. Now, I arrived on the 11th of January in 1955. In the old days, that was still, they had octave, so that was the octave of Epiphany. And there's a wonderful statement in the, you know, in, in Matthew's Gospel about the wise men coming from the East. Now, I came from the West, so that shows how wise I am. This had started with me in high school and, and uh, this idea of religious life. On the other hand, I thoroughly enjoyed medicine. And I was going with a girl that I met in St. Louis. And it's, it's like being in a canoe when you come to where the river splits. You gotta go one way or the other or you're gonna hit the sandbar. Basically, when I was either the happiest or the saddest, this is what I wish I was doing. And I figured I really would never be happy unless I tried it. Even the people who knew and followed Jesus asked him how to pray. And that's a question that still challenges people of all faiths. The monks of Mount Savior gather in the chapel to pray as a community seven times every day, but that's not the extent of their prayer. Prayer is a way of sustaining a relationship with God. And one method central to Benedictine life is called Lexio Divina, or divine reading. The older translations say 
In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Most modern translations say, in the beginning, when God began to create earth, God said. Or in other words, the first action of God, the first verb in scripture is God said. God is basically not a creator. God is basically one who wants to communicate with us, to be in communion with us. It makes a whole difference. And Lexio then is the response to God said. The first word of the rule of Benedict is asculta, which means listen. That goes very well with the word lexio, because that's what we're doing in lexio, we're listening. We're trying to discern what the will of God is in any particular circumstance, and to hear the message of God as it comes, in this case, through reading. So a very different approach from studying. That would be done slowly, and you wouldn't try to try to accomplish a great deal in, in a given period of time. You wouldn't try to read so many chapters in so many minutes or anything, but rather letting this come as it would, actually. You read slowly, you reflect uh, carefully what you're reading, and are encouraged to pray about what you're reading, and then if the grace of God takes over, Something lights up in the text, and we are caught in wonder and awe of the goodness and the mercy and the love of God. So it's that kind of reading, a reading which is intended to lead into prayer. It's a very rich concept. The problem is that we're so used to reading for information and, and entertainment that we, we turn everything into that. We sometimes say of somebody, I don't see what he sees in her. Well, if you loved her, you'd see it. If you don't love her, you won't see it. And it's a bit the same way with with Lexio. To listen to God, let God speak, and you stop speaking yourself, let God have some space and time and room to say something to you. That's one of the biggest lessons that modern people need to learn because they don't know that. And they think whatever they're going to learn, they're going to learn by the dint of their, their energy, their, their work, their study, and they're getting degrees in it, then they're going to know it. But when they have done all that and find, they still don't know quite what, quite what they want to know. Words as we use them are, are mostly empty, but words can be very, very full. For example, I can tell you that the Battle of Hastings was 1066. Well, okay, I told you that, that was my word, but it doesn't tell you much about me. I can tell you that I think Napoleon put back European history 200 years. Now, that's another word that I'm giving you that's coming from me. It tells you a little more about me, but not very much. Now, I, on all sorts, I can tell you that I love you. If that's sincere, uh, that is my offer of a gift of myself to you. And if you, and if you believe that, you come into a, we come into an encounter uh, which is, you know, indescribable. Now, you have to, it comes by belief. You can't prove it. I can never prove that I love you. You can never prove that I, you can never prove it either, for sure. You believe it. Because I always be fooling you or fooling myself or whatever. It's this kind of a word that we get from God, which is the expression of God's self. Thank you.
The word monk comes from the Latin monos, meaning one, and perhaps one of the greatest mysteries of monastic life to those observing it is how each of the brothers lives out the reality of being one person and simultaneously one community. When people talk to us, they wonder, is there something that lets you know that you're a monk and you're on the right trail or some way? Basically, it's coming to learn to love what you're doing and, and to love those peoples and things that are, that are part of it. It's really a question of sensitivity, trying to live the gospel message, which is mainly a gospel of love. And gradually, uh, you know yourself, hopefully, better so that you can serve better and uh, try to find a place in heaven when it's all done. St. Benedict in the rule speaks of, and the capsule definition of the lifestyle is seeking God. And so um, that search for God, seeking meaning in life and discovering who I am, who God is, we don't simply learn that all of a sudden in a flash and have it all together. It's an ongoing uh, process, and a learning process, a growing process. It's a lifelong process to become a true monk. I haven't been the best at it, and there's some real disappointments in the way I've been with the life, but the, still the, it is the life that, that um, I think was, when you say, cut out for me. I think one of the things that thrills people also very much is when you find something that is who he's meant to be, I mean, who is happy with being who he is, and that, that is a gift to other people, and an encouragement to other people. So we may start off our spiritual life as individuals thinking only of my prayer, my reading, and my ascent to God, I came to realize that it is not just me. It's in union with others. And if you want to push it really, it's with everyone else, you know, who's ever existed, who is going to exist, that somehow we're all in this together. Love really is at the depth of things and gradually we come to realize we are loved, which is absolutely necessary for us to love in return. I've said to people that someone who is really uh, slick, so to speak, or on the make is, 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 is very smooth. And someone who really loves is awkward. The most awkward lover I've ever encountered is God. And uh, God does the darndest things that would, would shake the love of anybody. But somehow or other we come to realize that that really is true love. Come down, we beseech you, O Lord, upon this house, and drive far from it all snares of the enemy. Let your holy angels dwell in it, and keep us in peace. And may your blessing be with us always. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. At the end of every day, the monks gather in the chapel for the final prayer of the evening. The crypt below holds a 14th century statue of Our Lady Queen of Peace. It's here where they offer their first prayer of the morning that the monks of Mount Savior seek the final blessing of their evening. Here they connect with the ancient faith and with all of humanity in its quest for a world at peace. Mary, we greet you, Father and Queen, all merciful, our life, our 